The Gospel of Mark has been such a wonderful, wonderful experience. Um, why don't we pray for this word and, and we'll jump into it. This is an exciting message today. So Lord Father, we thank you. We praise you, Lord. We are so grateful to be simply yielded vessels. I pray that you, that you pour out through the words that you've given me over the week, through the revelation that you've allowed me to carry. And I thank you, Lord, for, for today being the day that those revelations get to be birthed to the body, Father God. So I pray for, for hearts that are ready to receive and ears willing to hear, Lord. We praise you, praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, I'll tell you, back in 1990, I, I, I received an open water dive certification. Um, it was part of a, my SWAT unit, my special operations training. And, and we were down in some beautiful, clear water. And we're diving and we're doing the, the neutral buoyancy and then the triangulation. And, and I'm like, I dig this diving stuff. It's really cool. But then I come back on my first assignment and it's called black water diving or recovery diving where you're not in the ocean, where you're actually in the swamps and the bayous, and there's no sight whatsoever. So you go from beautiful vision to just feeling for maybe a body that had drowned or, or a weapon or something like that. There's zero sight. What I will tell you, it is always better to see clearly. It is always better to see clearly. And that's the one thing that the Lord put on my heart today, is that faith brings sight to the spiritually blind. Open your eyes to see the truth of God's presence all around you. Like Anna said today, we look for the big things. We look for the big things. And those are miraculous. But the little things. Simply opening your eyes this morning is miraculous. The pulse is miraculous. See God's presence all around you. Closing your eyes to reality does not impact your reality. Eyes wide open. Eyes wide open. Your spiritual eyes wide open. And this is the anchor scripture we're going to share today. This brings us the word that helps us to defeat spiritual blindness. And it comes from Mark 10, 46, 52. If we'll stand as the body and we'll read together. And let's begin. Now they came to Jericho as he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Then many warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Amen. Amen. Then they called the blind man, saying to him, Be of good cheer. Rise, he is calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. So Jesus answered and said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way, your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. Amen. That is a testimony. That is a message full of message. And we're going to walk through this today. And I'm going to start Mark 10, 10, 46. Now they came to Jericho. And as he went out of Jericho with his disciples in a great multitude... Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. Remember, Jericho was the first city conquered by the Israelites upon entering the promised land of Canaan. If you'll remember from Joshua 6, the walls of Jericho. What I will tell you, this city is experienced in seeing walls, barriers come tumbling down. Both physical barriers and spiritual barriers. And both of those barriers were broken down by faith and obedience. So in the Greek, when it says the great multitude, we've had this word many times before. It's aklos in the Greek. A great multitude, a big crowd is aklos in the Greek. And you know what it means? It means a confused multitude, a confused crowd. And it makes the distinction to say of regular people. We're not talking religious elites. We're talking about us. We're talking about good, blue-collar, grassroots people. 
So we say, well, why are they confused? Well, when it talks about confusion, remember, it's talking about your mental status. And your confusion, it results from a cognitive overload. It's when your brain's trying to, to process conflicting or unclear information. Like your mental capacity is overwhelmed and it lacks order. Why does it lack order? Because without the word of the Lord, you have no order. You have no structure. You're being fed the garbage of a demonic world that wants you to believe what the media spin of the day wants you to believe. You see, what brings clarity to your thinking and your understanding? It is the structure and the order of God's word. It is renewing your mind. We talk about it all the time. And I know we bust some emotional bubbles. We think that salvation is a boo-hoo and an emotional feeling. And I'm so warm and fuzzy. I love Jesus. You're my boyfriend. But that ain't the reality. Your transformation comes from the renewing of your mind. Your emotions are fickle. Who you love today, you hate tomorrow. It takes a true transformation of your mind, a retraining of your brain. Romans 12, 2, and I'm going to use the NLT version. It says, don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing what? The way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. I know that we, there is emotion, but the emotion comes from the manifestation of renewing your mind. You've got to put in the work. You can't hope to stay in love with Jesus. What you'll do, is like we do a lot of our relationships, we're only as committed as much as they do for us. We lock ourselves into putting God into a performance-based relationship. Most of us grew up with a performance-based relationship. You be a good boy, and you won't get in trouble. You get good grades, and I'll take you for a snack. Now, you be quiet when the adults are talking. You see, we all get all that performance space growing up. But that's not how God loves us. Thank you, Jesus, for not loving us based on our performance. It is an unconditional love. We've got to break our mindset that the world says, if you do what I tell you to do, if you like my social media post, when I post it, you're a good follower of mine. You see, that's not what God says. God says, I love you, even if you don't like my TikTok video. I love you anyway. But you've got to renew your mind. Renewing your mind brings stability to your thought process. Renewing your mind with the word of the Lord stops the aklos, stops the confusion. When I say we've got to read the word of the Lord, we've got to read the word of the Lord. Amen. We've got to put it in our mouth, in our mind, in our heart, so it saturates our soul. And I tell you, read it out loud. Don't worry if you can't pronounce the names. You ain't trying to impress nobody. Get that word in your mind. Renew your mind. Mark 10, 46 says, Blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. The Greek word for blind is tuflos. It's without physical sight or metaphor, metaphorically mentally blind. You see, this old boy has not encountered Jesus Christ. Mentally, emotionally, spiritually, he's blind. You know, Jesus gives other examples from Matthew 15, 14. Let them alone. They are blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, both will wind up in a ditch. Both will fall in a ditch. This is what the Oculus is doing. They are blind spiritually. Now, Bartimaeus, he's also blind physically. But I would venture to say that the physical blindness is going to allow him to unlock Amen. and receive healing for the spiritual blindness. Now, who is blind Bartimaeus? Well, what I'll tell you is he's the son of who? Timaeus. Scripture tells us that. What is also interesting is that the name Bar, it's a combination of, uh, of an uh, Aramaic word. Bar, it means son. So Bar, and then son of the father, Timaeus. Bar, Timaeus. And I know we like Bartimaeus, Bartimaeus. But it's two different words. We're talking about Bar, son of Timaeus. Now, I will tell you, in the Aramaic, there's also another alternative to the name. 
Because the TMA, it means unclean, impure. So it could be son of Timaeus, which means son of honor, or it could mean son of uncleanliness, depending on the translation. You see, because this was a cultural view for people with special needs and physical disabilities and mental disabilities. They were seen to be impure, unclean. They actually asked Jesus at one point, well, well how come he's blind? Was it his father or his mom and dad's? And what did Jesus tell him? He's blind so we can show the glory of God. Amen. You see, but in the double meaning of this name, it also shows the complexity of the various layers of our identity. I will tell you that if you, if you could get to the point where you strip down who you are as a son and a daughter of God, and you get all rid of all those other layers. Look, I used, to, I used to trip out when I was a chief of police. My status was all that matters. Hey, tell me a little bit about yourself. Well, you know, I'm a chief of police, and I've got a Ph.D. in cultural anthropology. And blah, 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 blah. Are you married? Yeah. Funny you didn't mention your wife first. You got kids? Oh, my gosh, we love them. Well, you didn't mention them either. You see, we get so wrapped up in labels of the world. And when the Lord will deliver you from that, who are you? I'm a son of God. I'm a co-heir of King Jesus. This is when we stop the complexity of multiple identifications. This brings confusion, aklos, to the body. I want to challenge you to see yourself as God sees you. I want to challenge you to see other people as God sees other people. Where the culture saw this old boy as just a blind beggar, Jesus saw him as with value and worth. You see, the physical ailments were believed to be a result of the sin. John 9, uh, 1, 5. Now, as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth, and his disciples asked him, uh, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? And Jesus answered, neither. Neither this man nor his parents sinned, but that the works of God shall be revealed in him. I must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. You see, instead of compassion, these people are seeking judgment. Hey, Jesus, who messed up? Who are we going to put the blame on today? Who are we going to throw a rock at? Come on, I got one in my hand. Who are you going to throw it at? That ain't God's way. By healing to glorify God the Father, Jesus shifts from blame to blessing. From blame to blessing. I will challenge us. Let's stop looking to lay blame. Let's start looking to work and do the will of the Father so we can declare blessing. So we can declare blessing. Mark 10, 6, it says, uh, Bartimaeus sat by the road begging. In the Greek, sat by the road. By the road, the word is hodos. And that means a path, a thoroughfare, to get from one place to the other. It also means a way or a system of doctrine. You see, that meant he was sitting there in a spiritual sense. He was sitting there with a certain doctrine. He was sitting there with a misunderstanding of who God was. And because the crowd was aklos, confused, they too were sitting there misunderstanding. What I will tell you is that Jesus is that thoroughfare. He is that path to get you from eternally damned to eternally blessed. Why do we know this? How do we know this? Well, go to the book. John 14, 6 tells us what? Jesus said, this is Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Hey, y'all, no one comes to the Father except through me. No one. All these websites and alternative notions and motions and all this lotion, it's a bunch of bull. There's only one way to come to the Father. My goodness, isn't it simple? When we moved from Louisiana to Texas, and I ain't never seen a highway system like this before, I had one road down the bayou and one road up the bayou. You couldn't get lost unless you ran into the bayou. And we moved to Texas. There wasn't just one way, one path, one thoroughfare, one hodos. It was a lot. Thank goodness my wife is from here. <laughs> There's one path to Jesus. Amen. What I will tell you is Bartimaeus was blinded mentally because he had not come to Christ yet. But I will tell you, he was on the path. 
He was on the path. You see, you, could, you might come here and you're like, I don't get it. I'm trying, but I don't get it. I mean, I dig it, but I don't get it. Listen, y'all, stay on the path. Stay on the path. Stay on the hodos. I will tell you, despite the confusion of the crowd, despite going back to your workplace, despite going back to your classrooms, kids, where you see a, a, a close, a confused crowd, giving their mumblings and their stumblings of what they did and what they should and what they... Listen, stay on the path. If you are willing to sit and wait and cry out to Jesus, you will come to understand the way, the truth, and the light. But you got to be willing to make a stand. So Mark 10, 47, we're continuing. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus... Son of David, have mercy on me. When he heard, in the Greek, it's akuo. It's where audible comes from, audio comes from. He was able to hear. It also means comprehend. So what is comprehend a function of? The mind. We get so wrapped up in, in different doctrine that it's all emotion. It's all emotion. And there is emotion. But it's got to start with your mind. This is the battlefield. This is where your war is won in your mind. This is where the devil attacks 24-7. Your mind. If he can confuse your purpose, your identity, your calling, he's already got a foothold. But thank you for Jesus. Thank you for Jesus. You see, and so when, when he calls out and he says, Jesus, son of David, Well, we know that Jesus is not the son of David, but he does come from the line of David. How do we know this? Because God made David the king that would have an heir who would reign over Israel forever. We go to 2 Samuel for this confirmation. When your day, he's talking to David, when your days are fulfilled and you rest with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you who will come from your body and I will establish his kingdom. Here's blind Bartimaeus. He may not know a whole lot of Bible. He may not know a whole lot of Scripture, but he knows enough to know that Jesus is son of David. I encourage you. I say, hey, hey, have you witnessed anybody? Have you offered to wash anybody's feet today? Well, I don't know a lot of Scripture. What do you know? Uh, I know John 3, 16. Say it. If you know one Scripture, say it. That word has the power to transform greater than all the things you can come up with. The word of the Lord is where the transformational power comes from. I know we like to pepper it and season it up a little bit, a little bit of gumbo, a little gumbo of testimony. And that's good because that over that overcomes. But what I encourage you to do is share what you know. Get your scripture. Rely on that scripture and share that scripture. Here's a blind beggar sitting out by the city gates, and hears, here comes Jesus. But he knew enough to know. He knew enough to know that he was from the heir, from the line of David. When this old boy says, have mercy on me, have mercy on me, from the Greek it means to give aid to someone or something in need. I would say that Bartimaeus was in need. But you see, his cultural value said he had nothing to justify Jesus' attention. The world would be like, who are you? I've told y'all before, in the kingdom, God puts us in front of people. The world says, you got no business being in front of. You will find yourself in front of people, influencers. And it's like, what am I doing here? You're there because God divinely aligns you to be there. Don't waste that opportunity, ooing and all, and over some celebrity you think is more valuable than you are. You are priceless. You were there for a purpose because God put you there. So the world's telling this old boy, you you can't talk to him. They don't even know who he is, but they know he can't talk to him. But don't buy that. Don't buy that from the world. So this old boy, Bartimaeus, is asking, have mercy on me. What I will tell you is an equipping moment. We're an equipping church. We're Ephesians 4, 11, 12 church. We are here to, to grow the body to do the work of ministry. When God's mercy, we miss God's mercy. Because we entangle it with our emotions, a lot of times our guilt and our pity and our self-pride. How many times you hear people say, well, I know God forgives me, but I can't forgive myself. Wow, your standard is higher than God's standard? 
Ah, don't put that curse on yourself. Or, I don't deserve mercy. I don't deserve. What you're looking at for is a little poo baby. Oh, shabebe, we say down on the bayou. Oh, shabebe. No, you're right. You don't deserve it. It's a gift. It's a gift. Bartimaeus is specifically asking Jesus to move beyond uh, feeling his pain into ending his pain. That's called compassion. From the Latin, it means co-suffer. It's a deep awareness of another person's pain. And compassion means you're motivated to help. Now, mercy is also from Latin, and it means wages and prices. By showing mercy, you cover that wage. So compassion is the deep feeling, the co-suffering with someone. Mercy is what the action is. You actually uh, forgive, or you move into leniency. This is what Bartimaeus was asking for. Jesus has the compassionate heart of a father. Now he's asking him for mercy. He's asking him to to move into the state of action. You see, a lot of us feel, we could feel compassion for people. We could feel compassion, compelled into action. Compassion, compelled into action. But it's the mercy that actually triggers the act of doing for somebody. I want you to focus. I challenged you last week to, to wash feet. To wash feet. And everything we do, do for the glory of God. I want to encourage you to cultivate the compassionate heart of Christ. You've got to cultivate that heart. It's like, I'm a nice person. Really? Okay. Let me see about four hours after the electricity goes off in the middle of the summer. Let's see how nice you are. Let's not depend on the fickleness of emotions. Pray that God um, cultivates a heart of compassion. That comes from reading the the word of the Lord. It comes from renewing your mind. But once you cultivate the heart of compassion, then I encourage you to move into mercy, to move into acting, the doing, to follow through on that compassion. I also encourage you. I want to encourage you. um, A lot of times we feel sympathy and empathy. Sympathy or empathy is, I've shared it before, somebody's in a hole and you walk by and you go, oh, you're in a hole. I feel so bad for you. And then sympathy is, oh, you're in a hole and you put a ladder in there and you jump down in the hole and now you're both stuck in the hole. Neither one does anybody any good. But compassion says, oh, you're in a hole. Here's a ladder. Get out. This is what I challenge you to do. We've got so many mature saints, so many people that are willing to wash feet. But make sure in that washing that it's born out of compassion, that it's born, the action is born out of, out of mercy and doing to help. I don't want to see you waste your oil. I don't want to see good seed thrown on hard ground. Learn to discern. Mark 10, 48 tells us, Then they warned him to be quiet, but he cried out all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. This is another equipping moment. I always tell you, show me your friends, and I'll show you your future. It is a sociological construct. Who's your five? Who are the five people closest to you? You will begin to reflect the aggregate of the five people closest to you. Make sure those five people are good people. I say, you want to be a knucklehead? Hang around five knuckleheads. You want to be a millionaire? Hang around five millionaires. Be selective in who you surround yourself with. Who is Bartimaeus surrounded with? What are they telling him? What are they going to tell him after he cries out? They're going to tell him to be quiet. I want to remind you, Proverbs 13, 20. Walk with the wise and become wise. For a companion of fools suffers harm. So he's with his peers when he decides to come to Jesus. And what did they do? I want to ask you, if if you've been in the faith for a long time, or if you just came to the faith, and you got your friends, and you're at the club on Friday night, or or you're hanging out in the break room, and you're this and that, and you start talking about Jesus, and then everybody gets quiet. Remember those days? You want to go where? Church? On Sunday morning? Bro, we still hung over. Let me tell you, be aware of the aklos. See, these old friends, they didn't ask him, well, that's a good decision. That's a very wise decision. I think you're making the right move for your life. 
I, I applaud you for, for crying out to Jesus. No, what did they do? They rebuked him. They rebuked him. In the Greek, it's epitemo. This is the same word that Jesus uses when he rebuked the demon the first time he walked into a church. This is the same word that Peter used when he rebuked Jesus after he told him about his death, that he predicted his death. This is a very strong, harsh, hey, bro, you need to be quiet. Don't call out to that Jesus. Let's just sit here and beg all day. Y'all, you got you to choose your circle. You see a circle of lost friends? Want to keep you lost to keep your friends. Don't allow the crowd to crowd you out of coming to Jesus. I think about the, the woman with the issue of blood. She fought her way through that crowd to get to Jesus. I'm encouraging you, if there is anything that is blocking your way, either people or mentality or whatever the situation is, do not allow the crowd to crowd you out from coming to Jesus. Bartimaeus rejected the man's to be quiet. He pressed in to encounter Jesus. You see, he was blind, but he cried out. The paralyzed man was lowered through a roof. Zacchaeus, he climbed a tree. And the woman cursed with blood, she fought a crowd. Church, I want to ask you, what are you willing to do? What are you willing to fight through to come to Jesus? What is blocking you right now? from going all in for King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Friends don't stop friends from finding Jesus. And if they do, you need new friends. So Mark 10, 49. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, be of good cheer. These are the same clowns that just rebuked him. Be of good cheer. Rise, he's calling you. When it says Jesus stood still, in the Greek, it's histemi. It means to stand fast, to be firm, to be permanent, to endure. This is the same word used in Ephesians when Paul is talking about resisting the devil. Jesus is our example to stand firm, to resist the attacks of the enemy. Whether it's a Pharisee or a blind man's buddies, we are all called by example to stand against anything that stands against God. Amen. I want to read to you from Ephesians 6, 11, 15. Put on the whole armor of God. This is the whole armor of God. Not just the sandals, not just the belt. The whole armor of God. That you may be able to what? Stand. Stand, the same word, against the wiles of the devil. The wiles mean, in the Greek, it's methodoso. It means one way, one tack, one method. It's one way that the devil has to attack you. He's only got one route. He's only got one way, and it's to attack your mind. Stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to what? Withstand, the same word, withstand in the day and having done all to what? Stand the same that Jesus did, stand. Therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Listen, all he's asking you to do is stand. I'm going to show you. This is a fighting stance. This is how you do it. Get ready. Okay, in case y'all missed it. Watch. What am I doing? I'm standing. I'm standing. That's all he's asking you to do. He's not asking you to karate fight or Chuck Norris. Or just stand. stand. You, know those, you know those sandals of peace? The, the real Roman warriors, they wore them. They had spikes on them. And that was to help them when an enemy would attack. Sometimes those spikes were three inches long. And they would be in the ground so deep that when they got hit by the enemy, they did what? They stood. You know what else those spikes kept them from doing? Running in retreat. I know sometimes when you're standing against an attack, an onslaught from the enemy, I know you feel like, mm, mm, man, 
Things were better when I didn't go to church. Things were better when I didn't pray out loud. Things were better when I didn't declare that my marriage was my number one ministry on this earth. So I'm going to keep that quiet. Because it seems like ever since I got married, ever since we reconciled, ever since we started teaching a marriage class, man, our marriage has been under attack. Yeah, no kidding. The devil hates it. All he wants you to do is stand. Stand. Stand and resist. Jesus stood. You stand. I want to ask you right now, because the Holy Spirit has has allowed me to, to say, if you are under attack or under onslaught, if you feel like you're being pushed and pulled and pressed and prodded, I want to invite you to simply stand right now. Simply stand. Let this church raise a hand towards you, and we will make a declaration of the power of God over your life. And this is never to embarrass anybody. But if you're willing to make a a, a prophetic gesture to, to stand, to declare that you will stand against the attack of the enemy. Amen. Amen. Mm. It is good that there is a body of mature believers that know the value of standing. So Lord, I pray over this body. I pray over everyone who is under attack, who is feeling pushed and pulled and pressed and prodded. I pray over everybody that, even even if it's a little bit of self-pride that's causing resistance in your life. I pray that you simply stand. Stand in the presence of the Lord. Allow the Holy Spirit to give you the assurance that you were were on the right hodos. You were on the right path. Simply stand. In Jesus' name. Mark 10, 49. Be of good cheer. Rise. He is calling you. Now, these are his friends. Now, this is pretty obvious. I mean, we've all got people like this in our life. Don't do that. Don't do that. Oh, hey, he's calling you. Be of good cheer. Look, these are people who are unstable. People standing on the rock of Christ don't rebuke and then cheer. Be selective in who you surround yourself with. People who do not know Jesus are the aklos, the confused crowd, because they have not renewed their what? Their mind. They're still wishy-washy with emotions. They're letting the world dictate everything. Look, I don't I try not to discuss things of today. But, but I don't watch the Olympics, but after that opening ceremony, and everybody's all riled up. But you know what I know? I know how it ends. I know how it ends. You see, that's just an hour on television. It doesn't affect my mind. I'm not in the Oculus. I know how it ends. When we know how it ends, it don't mean we approve of it, but we don't get it wrapped up in our emotions. we got bigger things to do. So people that don't know Jesus are Oculus. They're confused. They don't know the word. They've not renewed their mind. They're unstable. James 1, 5, 8 tells us, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives all to all liberally and without reproach. And it will be given to him. All you got to do is ask. All you got to do is ask. But let him ask in faith with no doubting, for he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. This is what these friends are. Like, bro, don't don't call out to that guy. You don't even know if he's got a Facebook page. And Jesus like, hey, he's calling you. How many people do we know like that? Let's not be those people. And look, any of us that lacks wisdom, and I would venture to say, until that perfect day, until that day, we all lack wisdom in one area or the other. Do not hesitate to ask the Lord. Amen. When we moved to Texas, I had no wisdom about the, to the traffic system. I'd pray, Lord, which way do you want me to go today? And I'd venture to say, in 10 years, I probably never got stuck in a traffic jam. Now, I don't know if that equates or just a wife with a good sense of navigation, but we don't hesitate to go to the Lord and ask in all things, particularly wisdom. I want to encourage you. Your stability does not come from your personal ability. It does not come from your sense of humor or from your bank account or from from your just your charismatic personality. 
It comes from the Lord. Yes, amen. You know, I want to... I, I was researching it this week, and this is an equipping moment. I read a report this week that says 73% of young people who are dating have a backup person in case the one they're dating does not work out. It's called benching. Benching. Here, sit on a bench. It's called benching. 73% of young people. I would venture to say that a lot of believers, they bench Jesus. I'd venture to say that a lot of believers, they bench Jesus. Just in case it don't work out. Just in case that prayer for healing doesn't work. You see, you keep a little money on the side. Down in the bayous, we call it mad money. You keep a little money on the side just in case Jesus fails to come through on that provision. You keep them old contacts in your phone. Just in case those church friends flake out. You keep paying your subscription to that porn site just in case God's word ain't enough to renew your mind. Good. Are you benching Jesus? Are you benching Jesus? Look, I know it's weird. I know it's weird to go all in for Jesus. You will not, you cannot imagine as a chief of police in full uniform on city hall steps with Max as about an eight-year-old praying on day of prayer over the city that I was a chief of police speaking in tongues, making prophetic declarations. What do you think those people thought of me? What do you think I thought of those people? I had compassion. I had compassion for the Oclos. And I moved through mercy to offer those prayers for that city. I know it's weird to go all in for Team Jesus. You got you to gotta give it all away. And you know, sometimes, as long as you're just like a little religious, just a little religious, you can straddle culture's fence. Like, we can stay in touch with them old friends, and I can go over here without getting thrown out. But you're benching Jesus. What I'm asking you, I'm asking you, like Bartimaeus, don't straddle the fence. Don't bench Jesus. You go all in. This brother was firmly planted on the rock of Christ. Ellie, if you want to come up. I want to tell you, Mark 10, 50, this is how you come to Christ. And throwing aside his garment... He rose and came to Jesus. Listen to the significance of what this says. In the Bible, states of dress or undress are symbolic of your vulnerability or your resistance to God. Bartimaeus is a beggar. Would you guess that that garment, that that robe, is probably all he's got to his name. It is probably all he's got to keep him warm at night and to protect him from the sun during the day. But because he had a dependence on Jesus, he threw his robe to the side. He let go of his hindrances. You see that old robe, if all you do is sit, you're probably a little wobbly legs and your legs have gone. You throw off anything that hinders your pursuit of Jesus. If it's friends, if it's possessions, if it's fear, you got to let it go. Amen. Nothing to hide. This brother had nothing to hide. He came to Jesus without a robe, without a garment, exposed himself completely, his sins, everything. What did Adam and Eve do when they sinned? They hid themselves. They hid themselves. Be like Bartimaeus. Come with nothing to hide. Amen. And the last is prune to pursue. Prune to pursue. In our marriage class on Wednesday night, we talk about toxicity, toxic relationships. Start being discerning as you're walking through this season. Start being discerning. You are warriors for the kingdom. You cannot fight a battle if you're encumbered with all this junk, with all this ornamentation hanging off of you. You got to let it go. Let it go. Prune to pursue. So Mark 10, 51, so Jesus answered and said to him, what do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, Rabboni, that I may receive my sight. What I want to ask you is Jesus asked Bartimaeus the same question he asked who last week. Remember James and John, when they wanted to sit at his right hand and his left hand. Mark 10, 35, 37 says, and he said to them, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, grant us that we might sit at your right hand and one other on your left hand in your glory. Why did Jesus do for Bartimaeus, but he didn't do for his two best friends, James and John? Why? Because John 14 tells us, and whatever you ask in my name that I will do, 
that the Father may be glorified and the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you are offering up prayer petitions and they feel like they're bouncing off the roof, the next thing you got to ask yourself is everything that comes out of my mouth meant to, number one, glorify God the Father. If it's about you, it ain't going to happen. It ain't going to happen. An equipping moment. Jesus wants to heal you. But I'm going to tell you, His primary mission is not your pain-free need. His primary mission is glorifying God the Father. It's glorifying God the Father. What brings glory to God through healing miracles? People receiving Jesus Christ as His Son. This is what brings people to Christ. This is what glorifies God the Father. How did restoring Bartimaeus' sight affect Bartimaeus? Well, Mark 10, 52 tells us. Then Jesus said to him, Go your way. Your faith has made you well. And immediately he received his sight and followed Jesus on the road. You see, him receiving his sight is not the big deal. The fact that he followed Jesus is the big deal. You see, Jesus says, go your way. Like you're healed. Go your way. It means you follow your own doctrine. You are free to hodos. You are free to go your own way. Because I love you and I give you free will. You have a choice. But what did this old boy do? And follow Jesus on the road. Hodos, a manner of life. The way is a term for the Christian lifestyle. Him returning his physical sight was not glorifying God. The glorifying of God is him following Jesus. When presented with free choice, he chose to follow Jesus. Let me ask you, how do we know that that glorifies God the Father? Luke 15, 10 tells us, Likewise, I say to you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Would you say that Bartimaeus repented that day? Would you say that that sinner, former sinner, now follows Jesus? I will tell you that there is joy in the presence of the angels. It glorifies God. I want to encourage you that faith brings sight to the spiritually blind. I encourage you, if you're on a path and you just don't get it, stay on the path. Wait, linger, be willing to cry out to Jesus. You will have an encounter with him that will transform your life. You may not be able to see what's happening in the natural, but you can discern what's about to happen in the supernatural. Do not grow impatient in the waiting. I encourage you in all your encounters before the Lord to throw off the garment, to throw off whatever's holding you back. If it's bad friendships, if it's pride, if it's fear, cast it out. Cast it out in Jesus' name. So if we can stand as the body, I want to make this invitation for for anyone that has not received Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. I want to extend this invitation to make a rational choice, a rational choice. You get to decide who you choose to follow. I will tell you that if you are not following Jesus Christ, you are following Satan. There's no neutral ground in this war. And I don't say this to to scare you, but I just want you to be 100% sure that if you have not made the decision to receive Jesus Christ, that you are following Satan. So I invite you to to make that decision today. If you choose to come up, and and if you'd rather not come up, then talk to one of our altar ministry leaders or one of our elders and talk to them about making that decision. I make that invitation. This is the most important decision you're going to make. Not who you marry, not where you work, not where you go to lunch after this. It is receiving Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. So, Lord, Father, we thank you, Lord. We praise you. We praise you for the, for, the, for the practical field training guide that is the gospel of Mark. I thank you that we've been walking through this gospel message since last August. I thank you for the maturity of the body and the equipping of the body as we, as we walk side by side with your son and the disciples. Thank you for the reality of the healing miracles. Thank you for the restoration of physical sight, but more importantly, spiritual sight. 
Lord, I pray that if there's anyone here today that's got a, a little struggle with their, with their spiritual vision, that they, that they remain at the altar and allow us to pray. We allow us to pray over them, to, to cast out the aklos, to cast out the aklos, the confusion. Lord, I pray a special blessing over this body. This is a mature body. This is, a, this is an equipped body. This is a body of godly leaders prepared to lead in ungodly times. And I thank you for it. So, Lord, we love you and we praise you. Mm. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We pray this in the almighty name of King Jesus. Amen. 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 Amen.